about leading open source enterprise teams. And I want to start with three short uh, stories or <laughs> things to, that I want to tell you. I mean, do you know Terry Pratchett? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard this quote about the potatoes of defiance? I really love it. I was inspired to do a talk like this by seeing somebody lead in a trying to lead open source people in a very military way <laughs> with a lot of authority and power and uh, fear and well he failed <laughs> um, I cannot say to my amusement but uh, it was ex it, it, it felt expected <laughs> it felt to be expected so I, I I got some learnings and I found that this is something that uh, not the military part of it or whatever, but the the learnings about open source people uh, was something that is good to be shared. And I, in, in in doing some research, I found out that this is like a red, do you say a red line? No, not you don't say that. This is like an experience that has grown in me through all of my professional life. Getting people to do things over whom you do not have any power. So it's more a question of motivation and inspiration than exerting pressure on them. So this is what this talk is about. And you see the, yeah, I love this with the potato. This is a potato flower, by the way, for those who don't know. And I didn't know they have such beautiful flowers, but you know, they, they grow underground, you don't see them. And that is exactly what this says. And I've seen that happening. When you put too much pressure on people, they'll be like, oh, let me, let me in peace. Yeah? And you won't get what you want. Um, nevertheless, there is a big myth in management that Cortes burned his ships to motivate his people. But that is only half the story, as I found out, because Cortes was also known, also known as Cortesilio, the little Cortes. Yeah? And he had been in prison before, and he had had a long fight with his boss, the governor of Cuba, who sent him to, middle, to Central America. And... Uh, it was pretty obvious why this guy would have some problems with loyalty in his fleet and among his men. And uh, he had, or the, the whole group, the whole people, the whole um, military group that was sent there, they had already fulfilled the orders from the governor of Cuba, but Cortes had his own goals. And that was why some people said, hey, forget that, we'll go back to Cuba now. And he was not very amused about that. He didn't like that. And, uh, yeah... Those men, still loyal to the governor of Cuba, they conspired to seize a ship and escape to Cuba. Cuba. So they wanted to go back to the higher loyalty, huh? not to those th that uh, Cortes wanted. Or no, they did not want to help him on his, his uh, conquest for his goals. Huh? And, uh, but he moved swiftly to squash their plans. And he burned the ships, in fact, to make sure that such a mutiny would not happen again. So basically it was that the, the, the lesson learned from that story to me is he didn't motivate his people. Yeah? If somebody's trying to, to use a lot of pressure, you should sometimes maybe question what his goals are. Are they the same as your goals or why is he doing that? And uh, nevertheless, this is a big myth in management. I don't know if you have heard that before. We burn the ships and everybody has to do that. Yeah. It doesn't work it so it doesn't work that way in open source. Another picture, why did Hitler not get the bomb? There is a classical view on that and a recent a theory that I think that, that many historians and psychologists and also um, physicists, physicians, physicists, physicists. Yeah? Um, like to to adhere to that in the classical theory says that the scientists knew what an, uh, uh, a nuclear bombs in the hands of Hitler would have been, what a big problem, what a big mess that would have been, and therefore they actively did not help develop it. But probably that's not really the truth. The real truth behind the whole story may be that their subconscious uh, stopped them from being innovative. And not for moral reasons. No, it was much more for uh, a blockage caused by the fear that they might have, in, even if, so if they were successful or if they were not successful. Both 
would have been uh, would have had consequences for their work situation. To understand that, you must know that the Germans had something that the Allies called the Uranium Club. This was a group of groups of scientists all spread all over Germany, not like a big Manhattan project, but spread all over Germany. So they could work close to their families. They had a really good life in hard war times, and um, they. They knew that sub the theory is that their subconscious told them when we fail or when we are successful, this will mean we will have to leave this comfort zone. When we fail, we have to go to the front and do some other research or do wartime, yeah, or really fight. When we, when we succeed, um, there will be our project or we will have to go somewhere else to production and whatever. Factories help produce those arms. They didn't think about the consequences the arms had but they thought about the consequences, or that is the theory, consequences for their private life being removed from their families and from their own comfort zone. That is, part of that is um, a result of research they did into tapes. Uh, the Allies in, in England did in the tapes. They uh, recorded of the conversations of those German scientists in Farm Hall in Britain, which is where, they, where the Allies, after the war ended, brought the German scientists, they gathered them there, and they recorded their conversations. And then they confronted them with the successful uh, attack on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So for the first time, these scientists heard about a working nuclear bomb. And, by, and what they talked, they, that was analyzed by psychologists and uh, by physicists. And, and they found out uh, their findings and historians. And their findings is that they were really surprised, so they really did not know it was possible, and that their process over the following days shows that they they got the they understood what they where they were wrong only after this uh, after the event of that American nuclear bomb was successful. So the core finding, which the psychologists in this case say that this is so convincing that there has to have been a subconscious blockage, because there were people like Heisenberg in this group. So the brightest minds of that time, yeah? And they were like, the, 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 the physicist, physicists analyzing that said, they did simple mathematic errors, which we cannot explain. And it's, and, but at the same time, the psychologist said, it's absolutely credible. They didn't know they had done this mistake. They didn't see that. And so the psychologists say, there may have been a psychological barrier caused by fear in the subconscious. And here we are, why I'm telling this story again. Again, it's fear. And as we say in German, fear is not a good advisor. There must be other things that makes people do things, yeah, that makes people move. And especially in the open source world, uh, you know, it, there's, it's, it's easy to get a job somewhere else in the open source world, in Linux and IT also. Yeah? So the amount of pressure me as a manager can exert on my people is pretty low because they will just leave or take another job in the same company. And uh, even money doesn't, doesn't work that well for that purpose because as one of your fellow Americans, Clarence Francis from General Foods once said, you cannot buy enthusiasm and you cannot buy lo uh, loyalty. You have to earn that. So. What this whole thing is about is uh, that we have to have different approach to motivation and inspiration in open source and possibly in, in most of the jobs related to in any way creativity. So nothing of that, what I'm going to present, is uh, really from, made up from my own mind. It's just uh, stuff that I researched, initially <laughs> triggered by this uh, seeing this military man trying to govern open source people. And yeah, it's, I've got lots of slides because I've done lots, invested lots of um, work into this talk and I've done it before. And I would like you to interrupt me and ask questions and tell me, okay, I would like to go deeper into that. And I can say, yes, I have more stuff there. And there will be other parts where I'm like, okay, I'll go faster over there. All the slides will be available to you, yeah, either via direct mail or through the conference sites. And my slides are, as you may have seen already, mostly 
there's a lot of information and some link, so they are pretty well suited or meant to be well suited for further study later. Okay, let's roll. Why am I here? Well, I sort of love challenges and danger. This is me at the age of 18 sleeping on the top of an active volcano in southern Italy. That's a few years later in Serengeti in Italy, uh, in Italy, in Africa, in a national park. And that's the sign on the tree in the back. And so in, in, in retrospective, I, I must be somebody who, who likes danger somehow. And that is how my team sees me. That's pictures they post from me after a team meeting. And they, they post pictures and say, that's my manager. <laughs> no, okay. I have a long yeah, history. I studied a lot quite some things from geography to American to, to English and uh, 20 years ago I started my own company and I've been in, around in Linux since 1994 and then I was a journalist for eight years at Linux magazine Germany and uh, the last five years as deputy editor-in-chief. I've done work as a consultant for a company who called himself Bleeding Edge Linux Company and since 2015, I'm in my first uh, real people manager job at SUSE. Yeah. I, as you see, it's some pictures. I love traveling and I love doing weird things. Every one of them a lot, uh, is, a, is a story of its own. Uh, as a journalist, I came to meet some interesting people. That's the daddy of Linux Torvalds. And uh, in... The, the island of Tunham in Finland, where Linus used to spend his childhood days, and we were going there on the boat of, of, of Niels Torvalds, his father. And in his book, Linus wrote that fun is the most driving factor for most of the people, especially in IT, especially in programming. And not because we get paid or, or adulation by public. No, it's fun, just for fun. And that's also the title of his book. And... Um, yeah, just for fun, I, I founded my own company in the 90s, and I've got three pictures here that may seem familiar to some of you who were around then already. That was what our offices looked like then. That is what our project management looked like then. That is what our AC in the data center <laughs> looked like then. <laughs> yeah, note that it was the fan was blowing outwards. It was blowing the warm air out. <laughs> and I learned... I had all my own employees, students, interns, and yeah, you can see that my authority, you see the tongue, yeah? <laughs> my authority was always big. And, but I learned that, that there is a big difference between people and machines. Yeah. And as a consultant, I was so happy about this entrance of the, the company then, because this was in the late 90s, this was new, somebody did a Linux penguin at the door. But I learned that I am also supposed to sit between the chairs. So if this, pic is, if this is the picture, then this is the customer and what the customer wants. This is what uh, me as a consultant thinks might be the best technical solution for the customer that he might be uh, happy about also in two or three years. But that is what my boss wants. <laughs> and my boss wants to sell as m many hours of me to the customer. So I, I always had to be in between and I had to... I found out that I always had to find out ways of making people things do which I could not control or could not, yeah, didn't have any power. Same applies for the writing stuff for Linux magazine, um, where you have people who just want to write about stuff they think that's cool, that they develop, or where they contribute. And so, but at the Linux magazine, we had deadlines. So we have this guy who wants to write another two pages of text for his great tool and I tell them listen we've had the deadline yesterday stop writing send it's the same and so I always had to combine two fragile elements without popping one of them or without destroying one and so I ended up with SUSE in Nuremberg second largest Linux distributor inventor of enterprise Linux of the term and, yeah, pretty creative and pretty many nerds and fun people at this company. And, yeah, the, the company was founded in 92, so it's 25 years old. It's 26 years old. We had our 25th anniversary last year. And that's pretty crazy. I work at a company where I get a call from, 
from one guy who's working with our consultants and he says, Hey, they call, Marcus, you gotta give me some information. I want to talk to them about documentation. And I'm like, yeah, okay, what's, why? And he said, yeah, they all, all our consultants will meet in Provo in Utah, Utah next week. And that only happens every 15 years. And I'm like, when has an IT company heard such a sentence that only happens every 15 years? <laughs> so the company is very old and and that is exactly the Linux I started with. That was my first Linux, 1194. That was my first time I had Linux installed. And as an, so I learned in, in, in my life, both as a journalist or as a consultant or now as a team lead, I am both API, bridge, translator, airbag, carrot, and stick <laughs> for the people. So this is uh, the Lunar Roper. It's airbag. This is what I have to do. I have to be the problem. Uh, Solver, yeah, removing rope blocks, and this is this is what I come in, and then here is the the RJ forty five network cables. All the rest is just I have to find these things. That's just my job, uh, but I'm also the the connector between different ways of communicating the API between management and technical people, or the API between users who read our documentation and technical nerds or yeah, experts on the other side. Yeah, the translator, I said that. Or the bridge between two sides, even though the bridge may sometimes not look very reliable. <laughs> it's the nature of the things. And that is a large part of my team. My team is 14 people right now. This is in Prague, where we met some years ago. And some of the, these two guys here, they have been doing documentation for SUSE more than 20 years. So that's also that's awesome. One of them, 25 years. And it doesn't happen much anymore in these days. So and now we're entering the theory of what this talk is about after you know more about me. Um, the typical situation that you find in that you find yourself in when you're a consultant or when you're in, in, in professional enterprise IT is like the one maybe I don't know if you don't know this video, watch it. It's wonderful. The expert comes in with marketing and sales guys to a customer and the customer requests this this please draw seven red perpendicular lines, some with green ink and some with transparent ink. And the expert says Oh, that's not possible. And then the marketing guy step in and says uh, to the customer, I'm sure he didn't mean it that way. I'm sure it is possible. We just have to find out. And it gets hilarious. But it's, it's really, that's so typical. And in all of this typical stuff that's happening, people expect you the, as the team lead or the manager to be that. The eye in a giant storm. Yeah? And, uh, and they rely on you to stay as calm as that. And what do they want? What does the management want? The man management always wants great numbers. Yeah? They want to have that the income has to be fine. And if you see here, this is German, but never mind. This is some project that's been running since 1990 to 2016. And hell yes, they, they, have, they have a lot of visitors. So the visitors are going up, but the price for the event or whatever it is goes up even more than the visitors. And they have even more bands. So what, what might that be? Well, in fact, the people who did this said, are said that the inspiration is the driving factor for their success. Yeah? We are convinced of what we do. We are, we are and will stay the village guys. We are still the ones who travel the world to see and choose bands. Yeah, you may have figured out that it's about a concert event. Yeah? And I don't know if you know, are familiar with European heavy metal scene. This is Wacken. Wacken is in northern Germany, is a very small village, and this village totally freaks out when some, uh, yeah, some how many, 10,000, no, some thousands of heavy metal fans come there by now. And so, this is a business, a model for business success. As you saw the last slide, this is the, what, this is the German site, it's the Times magazine, the German one, very, very renowned. And this is under careers, yeah? And this is um, a role model for management, okay? And I love that. And this is the role model for management today. <clears throat> it's a little bit different. Oh yeah, I forgot to say, the second spark for this, um, for this talk was a management training that I had, and the trainer was 
inspired by 1960s Harvard Business School mostly. And he got angry when we told him that an open source company does not work that way. And that was the second thing that inspired me to, to do this talk. So I, I looked up what does inspiration come from? And this is a well, classical talk or presentation on, on TED. It's, um, where is it? name here, damn it. <laughs> I'm missing the name now. Simon, Simon, Simon. Simon Sinek, there it is, oh my god. <coughs> yeah, that's what I meant, but I'm a little overturned already. And he's, he's famous for these circles, yeah? and he says, it's, if you really want to inspire, then it's about the why, not about the how or the what you do, because many people know what, or everybody knows what. Some, a lot of people do, how, do know how to do something, but the real, the why you should do something, if you can give that to people, that is, the spe that is, the s that is what makes inspiration special. Yeah. And more and more the how is replaced by the why in our yeah, disruptive technology, in our times of disruptive technologies. And uh, I want to give you two, that this is stuff that I want to give you to read. The Gerd Leonard is a, f a friend of mine, he wrote the book about technology versus humanity. It's a book from last year, and it's a very good read. And he says we are at a crucial pivot point. If you can describe your job, it will be automated soon. Yeah? And it's no longer about if or how we do anything, something. It's about why. So again, he, do, he says exactly the same. And uh, a guy from the 19th century, Albert Hubbard, said, one machine can do the work of 50 ordinary, ordinary men, but, but no machine can do the work of one extraordinary man. So what we're heading for, in my opinion, is a society where yeah, the, we, the, the, the work society, the workplace society, the job society will change or is changing already. And I personally think that the open source and the IT world is, is ahead of other branches. So let's, you can call it that I hope for that, maybe. But it's, um, happiness is the most important driving factor in the people, at least in my world, in the open source world. So I see when I, as a manager, I have to, one part of my job is to have and keep my team happy, then they will be fine to do the job that they are, that they should be doing. I will go into more details later, but happiness is at the core, and I think it will become even more important as our societies are changing. And here, this is almost a quote from Linus Torvalds, it's not fame and money that keep us happy. That is not only a quote, that is also, there's also scientific evidence of that. Um, you have, <coughs> what does, so when you talk with scientists, or when you uh, do some research, you find that um, the key to happiness is in your memory, in retrospective, but your memory has two different branches. You have the experiencing self and the memory self. Yeah? So one thing is how do you feel right now and how do you feel, how do you feel about the holiday, the vacation that you did last year? And what creates happiness in that? And um, there's interesting things in it. For example, they found out that no matter if you do a one week or a three week holiday or vacation somewhere, it's the last days that stay in your memory. Yeah? That, that coin uh, the, the perception of a good or a bad holiday. So interesting news to me, but there is a difference between how you feel at a very moment in time. So you may have like uh, three cool weeks, but on the last day you have a car accident. And that is really more important and that will coin the memory of that time, even though you had three weeks of nice memories. And it's the moment versus the story of your life. And they found out that most important for, for long-term happiness in people is good relations. They keep us healthy and happy. And it's not the amount, <laughs> it's the quality, the intensity of the relations. Yeah? <clears throat> money, however, can't buy happiness. But a lack of money buys you measurable misery. So we have, what we have here is the so-called landing zone. Yeah? If you pay too much, people are not going to be more happy. Yeah? But if you pay too little, they'll never be happy. So there is a strip 
that you have to hit a landing zone where you have to hit with your with the money that you pay to people where they are in a position that they don't have to bother about money yeah they have everything they need they don't have to worry about children's university or whatever payments or health insurance or whatever so they so they are just they are just in the middle range they are just happy they don't have to worry about being being burglar because they have such big cars or whatever yeah? just that and that is really hard because that's also highly individual where is your comfort zone there but that is so money has to be out of the game and that's really that was really an interesting uh, information for me and uh, so now that we have the good relations and money has to be out of, out of the game that's two things that's important for happiness but the key factors for happiness, or the further key factors for happiness, are flow choices and freedom, self-determined, self-paced, and autonomous life. So, money is not, but the choice is what makes many people happy. The ability to choose and the, the feeling of uh, being able to live a self-determined life. So, that you can get up in the morning and, ha and have a lot of choices about how your day will how your day is, is, is uh, passing by, what you're doing on that day. And quality relationships, financial security, good memories, and a self-governed job and life. There is, however, one more keyword in here that is important for us when we're talking about enterprise needs, and that is flow. I guess if you're programming, if you're coding, if you're creative, if you're writing, if you do anything, that you will know this state of being in a flow that you're sitting there and you're typing, painting, coding, whatever, and you don't notice how time passes. Yeah? Some people experience that with gaming. I'm not a gamer, but the creative people, yeah? And that is the state of mind that we want to achieve and we want to, to I say, enable people to get into. Yeah? So we want to have this, this happiness level that, that they don't have to worry about anything yeah, because that prevents them from getting into the flow. Even the subconscious will, have, will be counterproductive there. And so, yeah, there's the links to that. And so getting into this flow and, 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 and happiness is very important, even though like the, the, the Harvard Business School manager would say that's feel-good management. That's a critique on that. But research shows that Companies treating their employees in a friendly way are more likely to be more successful than their competitors. And you can even, there's even, okay, shit, this is German, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is even, Scheiße. huh? Scheiße. 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 <laughs> there is even um, proof that there is, that they are more successful on the on stock market. Companies with happy uh, employees are more successful on the stock market. And furthermore, there is proof that it's not the stock market success that makes the, the, the employees happy. No, it's the other way around. They can even prove that the happiness of the employees leads to a higher probability of being successful at, at the stock market. So there is scientific proof that when, when you keep your employees happy, your company has something like 4% or 3.8% higher probability of being successful. And that is against all classical authority theory stuff. I wonder... I was wondering about open source projects and uh, found some great articles from Tessa Miro on opensource.com. And uh, she, she has probably the best articles on <coughs> how to make, uh, because there's lots of stuff that's just not involved in, in pure open source projects that we are talking about. It's this is not really enterprise, it's complete free development and stuff. And uh, she says, she gives us good uh, guidelines about how to lead open source projects here. And transparency, encouragement, recognize, all these things. I just give you that as the core factors in open source that she says that are important for team building there. Cultural difference, respect cultural differences, transparency. You don't know where those people come from that will contribute to your project. This is just a global village. And especially important, culture of mutual respect. And yeah, the problems is just that put people in a position that they, that, they can, that they feel like that they can say yes and no, and even, oh no, I can't. I'm, I can't. 
stop because we got burnout in open source as well. There is, however, a little difference. She has she focused on the open source projects and leading open source projects, but we are in in this talk. I I, I want to focus more on open source enterprise teams. So we have the we also have the component of the the company and the company's interest and the, the company's well doing in terms of money and selling and performance. And that is where we come to this Tech Republic post that has 10 items on peak performance that also, that I found surprisingly different from what the Harvard Business School of the 60s would tell us. Yeah? And it's, that's why I brought the open source stuff before. Huh? Because it's, to me, it sounds like the same as we have in open source somehow. Um, you have if, if you don't do that, no, no open source project will be uh, successful. If you try to put people on stuff they don't like doing, it won't work. Yeah? And so you should focus them on the result. You should focus on results and productivity and not on the time clock. Yeah? When you're a manager that does micromanagement, uh, that, that, that won't work. I'll speak more about that later. But what you should do as a manager is align people with the stuff they're good at and they're passionate about. This is the same in open source, in open source projects, where they will align themselves onto these topics. Yeah? But if, if I'm a manager, I should try to find out what, what are they interested in, where are they good, and I should put them on these topics, of course. Yeah? And you should put your best performers on your biggest opportunities, of course. And the balance between aggressive realistic goals, that's also very important. Trust your people and let them know that you trust them. I'll have something later on how to build trust. Avoid blame, of course. And one very important thing, and that's something I learned, that we are not that good in the open source world sometimes, foster innovation by killing projects the right way. To determine the point of letting go, of saying, okay, no, this was a bad decision I took two years ago, but let's do it the other way now. It's, uh, yeah, that's a science of its own. And... This is something where I was told that I'm really good. I let my employees think. I am even using yeah, chaos theory for that. I hate my own chaos theory. And, Bless you. <laughs> Bless you. And build consensus by letting people know why. And anyhow, build consensus. This is against classical management theory, I think, yeah? Because this is all of that. There's one big thing behind that that is contribution, collaboration, and Transparency. Yeah? Yes. I had a quick question. Uh, how would you rate yourself about, about following all the stuff? Because that's that's the like I am honest thing, that's one of my problems when I get put in charge of stuff. Mm. Is I think I'm doing that stuff, but how do you really know? Like your your self analyzation. You talk with them. You go get? Mm-hmm. Or, or do you do like I uh, talk with my people okay. and I ask them. You, you, you have good relationships. That's the only other part. I mean, I, I try. Yeah, that that is that is one of my goals. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I yeah I. So. It's it's I have a I have a challenge, with with with. Yeah, with for example some some, well, I had a challenge with one guy or one person in my team, who who didn't really need the job. He was interested, he liked it, he did, but he didn't. Li neither did he need the money, nor did he need the job. Yeah? But he was interested in what, but he wanted to do it his own way. And we had, to, we had a lot of discussions until I told him, okay, you can do it that way, but you know, uh, you are contributing, but you're a bad example for some of the other younger folks yeah? who aren't as skilled as you are. Yeah? I and I had to talk several times with him to make him understand that, so, and, and, and that is, we have, uh, the, I have that in the conflict section later also. Okay. Talking, talking, talking transparency is my approach. I read a problem of nine. Because um, mm. having done stuff, I tend to start doing it. I'm, like, I'm, I'm not supposed to anymore. That's not, you know, if you mm. charge, you shouldn't be the guy doing the stuff. You should be the guy interfacing between upper and lower. Mm. Yeah, there's a race <laughs> condition there between uh, efficiency so it's sometimes it's simp it's just simpler to tell them, I've done that before. This is the blah blah blah, or this works like blah blah blah. Or uh, if you have the time to have them find out on their own, which is much more, which is worth much more for especially young team members, it's then it will stick 
it's, it's, it's better than, than just telling them, right? But that is, yeah, that's exactly the, the balance that you have to find, yeah. But I try to, so they know them, they know this, they read this presentation before I did it the first time and they gave me feedback on it, so they, they know how I do it. And, uh, is, is number nine more like, don't tell people <coughs> how to do it, but what we want to do? Is that kind of like, or like the end result be like, what, what I'm thinking is like, hey, if you have a, something that works better than what I do even, uh -huh. Do that as long as the end result is what we needed. Yeah, they come, they come up with their own stuff for things yeah. that I thought I had a perfect solution, but they come up with their own stuff, and I have to admit, oh fuck, this works so much better than what I always did. <laughs> and, and, and they're happy. And especially with young guys who are creative, like young people who are creative and and energetic and stuff. Uh -huh. And sometimes it's also like they, I tell them what to do, and they ignore it, and they do their own way, and they do it much better. And in the end, I have to say, okay, I should scold you, but, but this works. Let's 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 not talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's but that's all tr a question of trust, tr and and yeah. The most important is again have a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh my God, dox it or it didn't happen. That makes you reliable. Yeah, write stuff down. Be written about agreements that you had with people. Yeah, be transparent, reliable, measurable, and stuff. Sorry, I have to be a little bit faster already. Um, there is respons five responsibilities for leading el elite teams that I found. A culture of leadership, make the team feel safe, manage through chaos. Small changes in input may lead to a huge difference in output. So if I have 20 people here and I want you all to pr create the same output, I need 20 different approaches of, of make you be as efficient as you could possibly be. Yeah? No matter if I do the old fear method or the, the, the other method, but I have to realize that it that that it's individual. A team, my team of fourteen people is a team of fourteen individuals, and that is for me that is also like chaos theory. Yeah, you have to learn and find out which how to get people to to do what they should do. Yeah, and how how to make to make them do that. Uh, how to how to to make them like to do that. Yeah. The other thing is about servant leadership and always eat last. Yeah. And I did my homework in the first with the first line. I studied it. Yeah. I did my homework with the making mistakes and learn from that. But we have at Suzy we have a very big culture of mistakes because it is well known to, to all the management that it is the mistakes that bring us forward. And that is a very, very good thing. And you have to create a culture. And that is something that doesn't work with fear and, um, yeah, and strength and power, that people are afraid to make, make mistakes. And mistakes is what brings you further. And also they are needed for, for the creation of trust, as I will show later. Yeah, leadership is about coping with change and aligning a team to execute a specific vision. Yes, I, I can still sign that. <coughs> Even though aligning is a bad word. How do we spot, spot bad leadership? Bad manager, micromanager, I've said that already. A good manager delegates. Yeah? Um, I don't need to know everything. I, I, I just need to be informed when something goes wrong or when it's necessary. So I like to have my people <coughs> informed. I said that before. I like them to have transparent knowledge about how I do things and why I do things. And uh, usually the bad managers uh, need to keep their team in the dark. Do you know mushroom management? <laughs> mushroom management is when you have your team like uh, mushrooms. They, they grow in caves. They don't need much air, just enough air to breathe. And once they are big, you cut them off and wait for the next to grow. So I, I've known somebody who did that. I'll just jump over the creating a team phase with one remark. Uh, science says there's four phases in creating a team, forming, storming, norming, performing stage. So at performing stage, the team exists and works. Yeah? One thing I've, I noticed is that the job of the manager is always the same. It's remove roadblocks yeah? and provide feedback on the team's progress. Feedback and, and uh, uh, not minutes, uh, reports to the upper management. Yeah? Remove roadblocks, 
so that the team can do the work and report up the ladder. So that's exactly the same in all the phases of creating a team, as you can see. So we already said parts of that. A good boss lets his em employees participate in his decisions. He explains, he listens, asks, is open to suggestions and ready to admit, admit mistakes. He has to provide money and responsibility and support his, support his people and remove the roadblocks. Also the link to that. And one thing that I said is where I asked them, how do you think I perform? So I do one-on-ones -on with all of the team, meet team members that I have. I try to have one one-on-one -on -one every six weeks with, with one of them. Yeah? And, uh, oh, we're almost done. <laughs> And these review meetings, they, are for, they have two purposes. One of them is asking them, how are you? And they can ask me, and I ask them, how do I perform? Uh, what do you think? And so we have an open discussion. It's a one-on-one, -on -one, really in a closed room, so the others don't notice. And that's what we do there. We assess, we meet, talk, listen, measuring success, trust, respect, integration. Is the communication working? And really address this, these things, yeah? And are there any conflicts? Oops, this was a German anyhow. If we resolve conflicts, if we have a conflict, we have first make sure that both sides acknowledge that there is a conflict. Yeah? The second thing is we have to discuss it. We have to find a cooperative process and think about how can we fix this. We, can, we have to communicate. We have to clarify, collect facts, write down. And then one thing comes in that, I really, that is really helpful. We, we, we have to find a way of, of explaining to someone, what would you do in my place? You know, this classical thing, yeah? And then change sides, and that's some, you have to be careful that this doesn't look like a hilarious role play game, but it is necessary that both sides understand why the other side is doing what he's doing at the moment, yeah? Then we have to reach agreements, and written agreements in the best case, and do what we call postmortems, yeah? After something has gone down the drain, we meet together and we think, okay, what can we, what, what is our learning from that, yeah? For the next time to prevent that or that conflict from happening again. Yeah. Um, when assessing things, we have to make sure that we are not yeah, trapped in some bi cognitive bias things, like causal inference when you think that umbrellas cause rain because they pop up before the rain. Yeah? Whenever you see many people with umbrellas, you can be sure it will be starting rain soon. Thus, umbrellas cause rain. Banning umbrellas didn't stop the rain. Same thing, read about it with Madeira wine. Why Germans are called the Krauts and the British were called the Limeys. Fantastic story. Uh, both held against Scorbut, Scorbut? The scurvy, scurvy. Scurvy, right, scurvy. Uh, in, in the 17th century. Yeah? Yeah. What they didn't know is both have high levels of vitamin C but both believed that only this food would help. But the Germans didn't have uh, tropical fruit, which the British had. Yeah? So the British had limes, and, and, and the Germans had the kraut. That's why we have the krauts. <laughs> they, they completely assessed the situation wrong, but in the end, it worked. <laughs> and, and one of my favorite quotes from the Chaos Computer Club in Germany, that is what politicians use today pretty often, for every technical problem, problem there will be a political solution. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, what was the Madeira wine? Hmm? The first one said Madeira wine. Is there another talk after us? I can. Ex I don't know. Is there? Will there be another talk? Yeah, no, so I can go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. With the Madeira wine, it's a funny story. It's port port wine. Yeah. Yeah. And for <laughs> ages. So how it was discovered? <laughs> They, they had wine on the ships that went to India. And the wine, why they, when they arrived in India, the taste of the wine had changed. Mm. It had become port wine. Yeah? So for ages they thought they had to carry wine across the equator <laughs> to the southern hemisphere. And something magically would happen there and make the wine <laughs> port wine. So they did indeed load ships with wine, carry it <laughs> across the equator to the southern hemisphere, receiving Madeira wine or port wine, bringing it back, and they thought that the wine had to be brought across yeah, to the southern hemisphere, which in fact uh, was just a side effect of the heating, <laughs> of reheating it, and starting the, the process of uh, fermentation, 
again. Yeah. So once they discovered that it wasn't necessary to trouble the wine, <laughs> <laughs> but they thought that was so. They, they, there's just the misconception between uh, cause and result. And that's, okay. You can see that also as some sort of chaos theory again. But this is this is all stuff that is really and that's a challenge for the for management. You have to, finding the right cause for something and not get stuck in in uh, assumptions. Um, okay, three quarters of employees. Why is this so important? Three quarters. Hmm? Oh, what? Just laughing because it's happening. Three, three quarters of employees say their boss is the most stressful part. Uh, one third dreads going to work because of colleagues. Yeah, um, you will lose. Yeah, you will lose people if you fail to challenge them, if you fail to engage them, if you fail to value and reward them emotionally, intellectually, and financially. Yeah? that's the main cause of losing people, says Forbes. The employee, if you find yourself, or if an employee finds himself in, a, in such a situation of being sad or disappointed or having a bad boss, uh, Guardian suggests, and I can only uh, recommend that, document what you're doing, how much time you spend on it, don't sink to the level of uh, behavior that this bad boss will do, will have, and try to change the culture from within and go it alone. And that's not a nice process, but you don't have any other chance except quitting. Yeah? And you may find a new job easily in the open source world at least. Let me see the wolves we've seen later. The problem often is we have to be, for, for, for being innovative, we have to unlearn things. Yeah? We have to get rid of old assumptions. Yeah? And um, Unlearning, you can unlearn from new input, unlearn from the customer through curiosity or unlearning in advance. That means when you try to find new solutions to uh, current problems or situations. Yeah? And um, the less you know about a project, the more creative you can be. This is um, very important, especially in cases where people have their, their mindset. I've had I've seen a manager who always talks about always talked about us and them. The military guy did something sim similar, and they dug trenches between him and the rest of the company. And the people inside they really started believing in that, and that's that's really yeah. It doesn't it just doesn't make sense when everybody is on the same side, but one has the the duck and the other has the the. Can you see both animals? Yeah, and. Uh, Openness and creating an atmosphere of openness to new <coughs> impressions and new uh, experience is very, very difficult in teams, in enterprise teams. Um, that's also because we have, let me go to the next slide first, we have these cognitive biases in us. Yeah? We strive to be psychological consistent. That has several effects we have uh, these these biases come most of them come from evolution and from from the time that we were tribal and uh, we have some learnings that made us survive in in the wild and whatever and our mind and our body is somehow sometimes or our body our subconscious is sometimes a little bit slower than our conscious mind so though we know better we want to believe the wrong things or the old things yeah? and um, this is, it, 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 a person who experiences internal inconsistency tends to be psychologically uncomfortable, and then they start changing the reality around them. I think you all have seen people, like people who are with the backs against the wall, who don't have any other chance, they, they, they don't act rational anymore. Huh? That's part of that. That's part of why that happens. Yeah? And then they start, at the end, they start actively avoiding social situations. Huh? And then, then and, and the contradictory information. They just want to hear what they want to hear. And we have, as humans, we have lots of these cognitive biases in us. You should, if you're interested in that, that's the link to that, and it's a very interesting side. It also explains why change management, why telling somebody you're wrong doesn't work. 
you have to give them a story that works much better. Or, uh, yeah, that's called the, the, the backfire effect, a biological way to protect the worldview. The human brain will tend to, yeah, to, 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 ink, to close, to shut down before uh, accepting new uh, concepts. And that also, here is fear is a bad consultant that is, because it is triggering old instincts. So if you work with fear, you are much more likely to trigger backfire instinct and, uh, and defiance. Yeah? It's triggering old <coughs> fears, old inherited, uh, inst uh, inherited instincts. Good. Um, another thing, survivorship bias, that was also a learning from the Second World War. They analyzed the planes that came back from the bombing yeah, attacks. And all the spots where they had lots of shooting holes from, from the defenders, yeah, they would reinforce. Yeah. Until this guy told them, hey, that's, this is not the best idea. What about the planes that got taken down? Yeah. You, you, so he, he, he brought mathematical, uh, so this is Abraham Wald, and he brought up mathematical evidence that with this concept, they failed to protect the really relevant parts of the planes because if the planes got hit in those parts, yeah, they would go down and they were not in the statistic. That's called survivorship bias. This is a problem that is still very current today or very up to date when you're looking at, at uh, startups at the stock exchange. You only see those that make it. You don't see the mistakes of those that drop out early. And that's a very big concept. And that is, that is also, in my opinion, that is also a proof why making mistakes and the culture of mistakes is very important. And the last thing, last concept that I have is trust. I just, I just go quickly through that and give you this address. Case me, trust is a wonderful game. It takes a quarter of an hour and you will learn a lot about trust. It's game theory. And it's scientific, and it's, it shows pretty clear in the end that transparency is the road to mutual success. If you want to have a situation of trust, yeah, so we have happiness as one of the core things, and trust is another one of the core things in, in uh, leading open source enterprise teams. And transparency, again, is what creates trust. To have, if you want to create trust, you must have a situation where all sides realize and accept that there is a win-win situation for both sides. Yeah? Without that, there won't be any trust. Um, a minimum level of communication is necessary. A small amount of miscommunication is very helpful. And miscommunication increases with the amount of communication. So there's one core line between these, or one core statement between these lines. Um, miscommunication is helpful to create trust. And that's something that I really like. So you have to make mistakes in communication to create trust. If I, if I stumble on you and say something stupid and then we laugh about it and then we are good friends for an hour or whatever, then this mistake doesn't matter. It yeah? both parties. Exactly. And the trust also implies the fact that I know what happens after you make a mistake? Yeah? When you hurt my feelings, yeah? and, uh, and afterwards you, take, you realize that, and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way, and whatever. So the next time that happens, I will tell, hey, that's again the same as then. Do you remember? And you say, oh, yeah, yeah, fine. And that is how trust comes into being. So you, you need to have an, a, a minimum of miscommunication. The website has some very interesting insights into why social networks are prone to, to destroy trust between people. Very interesting. So the more a society is, is, is going into the social networks, into the, uh, the an anonymity, yeah, the less, the, 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 some scientists say that it's more probable to lose trust between individuals in a society the more, like, the more they take part in social networks. That's just some links there. I'm almost done. How fit are you? <laughs> just some fun things to stop for the end. 
some management anti-patterns. Yeah. Do you know them? I already said the bulldozer management. You know that? New manager comes in oh. with a bulldozer and all the good old knowledge is out. Everything new, he knows, he thinks he knows what to do and everybody's doing the same. We had mushroom manager. Do you know crocodile management? So you're the employees, you're like the gnus at a water hole, yeah? Drinking, yeah? And then sometimes, and suddenly a crocodile pops up, the mouth wide open, closed gun, and the water is clean again, but one of the water is still still again, but one of the gnus is missing. <laughs> and what do we have? Seagull management. <coughs> you you explain it? Uh, with a lot of noise. <laughs> so, comes in, makes a lot of noise, leaves shit all over, and is gone when it comes to cleaning up. I guess you've seen that. Management by numbers is like painting by numbers, yeah? Micromanagement and... Uh, ballooning. Getting bigger and bigger. So the more things go wrong, the bigger and more important he tries to be, or she. In self-inflating, yeah? Do you know Yamfi? I said that this morning already. <coughs> ah, he was there this morning. Don't worry, yet another meeting will fix it. <laughs> Wir sind Kaiser is a famous Austrian uh, TV show. Wir sind Kaiser means we are emperor. Austria was an em had an emperor before, and they are still very much in involved into this um, royal thing. And Wir sind Kaiser is a satirical TV show where the, the old emperor uh, gives audience to, to prominent people like starlets and, and f football stars and whatever. But he's sitting on a throne, and everybody has to talk in the third person to him. So, how is he doing? And stuff like that, yeah? <coughs> I've seen managers who do that. Definitely. <coughs> Others are trying to build empires instead of doing their work. And... Mm -hmm. Cover your ass. The programmer interrupt, that is the time that it takes for somebody to get back to his work while he's, after he's interrupted. Usually at least 15 to 20 minutes until you're back in your flow. Oh my god, I, I forgot what view graph engineering is. Ah, management porn and management and, and Marco RF, that's a PowerPoint and Excel. <laughs> when we have to do some things that makes managers happy when they look at it. That's why we call it management porn. Management porn AF is the extended version. I created that. That is management porn slash alternative facts. <laughs> My boss didn't like it when I told him about that. <laughs> a warm body? Somebody sitting in a team meeting not doing anything. He's not yet dead, but he's not, he's not yet a corpse. He's still warm, or she's still warm, but he's not contributing anymore. Good. And the last part is links for you when you get the slides about inspiration and motivation. Oops. Yeah, in the 21st century. Why rewards don't work. There's scientific evidence that rewards don't work. And they are counterproductive. The more intellectual a job gets, the more counterproductive the, rewar uh, the rewar uh, uh, reward, the more cognitive a job is, the more counterproductive rewards are. What motivates us is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. If we can learn something, if you work with things that we like to do, if we can learn something, that is motivating. If we think that, if we know the why of the job, why we're doing something, like open source, everybody wants to make the world better. Yeah? But that's a purpose. That's what motivates us. And autonomy is like, I can do this shit. I can know, I, that's also why mastery is cool there. Yeah? I can do this, I can learn about it, and I'm getting better and better. Yeah? Management is fine, but self-direction is better. So you as a manager should try to make yourself redundant. And that is about creativity, but that's for further study, I would suggest, because I'm already 15 minutes over time. Or do you want, yeah, okay, you still don't say no. <laughs> Stages of discovery, uh, as postulated, as, as uh, uh, phrased by Jack, 
Hadama, mathematician. He said, the first step for creativity is preparation. And this is something that you need when you manage creative teams or open source teams. You need to understand how it, how it works. Uh, when are they creative? Everybody has a, a different work environment under which he is creative. I have the best ideas when I'm on a train. I travel a lot with trains in Europe, and that is my perfect situation. I don't know, there's like a TV going on in the, in the window, <laughs> the, the landscape is rushing by, and that is my creative place. But So you have cognitive and subconscious phases for creativity. Yeah? You, have, you can prepare something, and but the real incubation is subconscious and runs in the background. The illumination is when the idea comes from the subconscious into the conscious sphere of your head. It's like puppets, that, exactly. That's the, the light bulb above the head. Yeah? And then the, the conscious will work on the verification. Yeah? The, the, the solution that was intuitively formed is now verified by cognition. That won't always work as planned, but what you should mind there is the role of the subconscious. And I have some anecdotes from, from, uh, from studies that I read that's, that are really interesting. But the core thing is, you see, and this is really the last slide. Creativity always comes lateral, mostly when you least expect it. Um, it's highly individual. <laughs> Focusing and concentration may be harmful. <laughs> and that is really crazy because it's the subconscious that does it. Yeah? And if you're too focused, then the subco you, you're somehow limiting the subconscious. Mm -hmm. And hyper-focus tends to, you don't see other possibilities. Exactly. So you try to solve a problem with a solution that might not be the best solution. Exactly. Yeah, so yes. There you go. And that's also where <coughs> clear sets of rules and strict orders are counterproductive if you want creative solution finding. And that's also something in, in, in literature that you find, and I, I really love that because I was, I was always that kind of mind. I always had that mindset. Yeah, creativity cannot be organized in processes, but there are environments that are highly beneficial to it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my <laughs> style. <laughs> I'm sorry for being that long, but... Ah. You seem to have enjoyed it still, no, not that many left. <laughs> <laughs> Questions?